Chapter Twenty Two of the Red House Mystery by A. A. Milne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Two. Mister Beverly moves on. Good Lord," said Bill as he put down the letter. "I thought you'd say that," murmured Antony. "Tony, do you mean to say that you knew all this?" "I guessed some of it. I didn't quite know all of it, of course." "'Good Lord!' said Bill again, and returned to the letter. In a moment he was looking up again. "'What did you write to him? Was that last night, after I'd gone into Stanton?' "'Yes.' "'What did you say, that you'd discovered that Mark was Robert?' "'Yes. At least I said that this morning I should probably telegraph to Mr. Cartwright of Wimpole Street and ask him to—' bill burst in eagerly on the top of the sentence yes now what was that all about you were so damn sherlocky yesterday all of a sudden we've been doing the thing together all the time and you'd been telling me everything and then suddenly you became very mysterious and private about dentists and swimming and the plough and horses and well what was that all about you simply vanished out of sight i didn't know what on earth we were talking about Antony laughed and apologized. Sorry, Bill. I felt like that suddenly, just for the last half hour, just to end up with. I'll tell you everything now. Not that there's anything to tell, really. It seems so easy when you know it, so obvious. About Mr. Cartwright of Wimpole Street. Of course, he was just to identify the body. But whatever made you think of a dentist for that? Who could do it better? Could you have done it? How could you? You'd never gone bathing with Mark. You'd never seen him stripped. He didn't swim. Could his doctor do it? Not unless he'd had some particular operation, and perhaps not then. But his dentist could at any time, always. Hence Mr. Cartwright of Wimpole Street. Bill nodded thoughtfully and went back to the letter. I see... "'And you told Cayley that you were telegraphing to Cartwright to identify the body?' "'Yes, and then, of course, it was all up for him. "'Once we knew that Robert was Mark, we knew everything.' "'How did you know?' "'Antony got up from the breakfast table and began to fill his pipe. "'I'm not sure that I can say, Bill. "'You know those problems in algebra where you say, let x be the answer and then you work it out and find out what x is well that's one way and another way which they never give you any marks for at school is to guess the answer pretend the answer is four well will that satisfy the conditions of the problem no then try six and if six doesn't either then what about five and so on well the inspector and the coroner and all that lot had guessed their answer, and it seemed to fit. But you and I knew it didn't really fit. There were several conditions in the problem which it didn't fit at all. So we knew that their answer was wrong, and we had to think of another, an answer which explained all the things which were puzzling us. Well, I happened to guess the right one. Got a match? Bill handed him a box, and he lit his pipe. "'Yes, but that doesn't quite do, old boy. "'Something must have put you onto it suddenly. "'By the way, I'll have my matches back, if you don't mind.' "'Antony laughed and took them out of his pocket. "'Sorry. "'Well, then, let's see if I can go through my own mind again "'and tell you how I guessed it. First of all, the clothes. "'Yes? "'To Cayley, the clothes seemed an enormous, important clue.' I didn't quite see why, but I did realize that, to a man in Cayley's position, the smallest clue would have an entirely disproportionate value. For some reason, then, Cayley attached this exaggerated importance to the clothes which Mark was wearing on that Tuesday morning. All the clothes, the inside ones, as well as the outside ones. I didn't know why, but I did feel certain that, in that case, the absence of the collar was unintentional. In collecting the clothes, he had overlooked the collar. 
Why? It was the one in the linen basket? Yes, it seemed probable. Why had Cayley put it there? The obvious answer was that he hadn't. Mark had put it there. I remembered what you told me about Mark being finicky and having lots of clothes and so on, and I felt that he was just the sort of man who would never wear the same collar twice. He paused and then asked, Is that right, do you think? Absolutely, said Bill with conviction. Well, I guessed it was. So then I began to see an X, which would fit just this part of the problem, the clothes part. I saw Mark changing his clothes. I saw him instinctively dropping the collar in the linen basket, just as he had always dropped every collar he had ever taken off, but leaving the rest of the clothes on a chair in the ordinary way. And I saw Cayley collecting all the clothes afterwards, all the visible clothes, and not realizing that the collar wasn't there. "'Go on,' said Bill eagerly. "'Well, I felt pretty sure about that, and I wanted an explanation of it. Why had Mark changed down there instead of in his bedroom? The only answer was that the fact of his changing had to be kept secret. When did he change? The only possible time was between lunch when he would be seen by the servants, and the moment of Robert's arrival. And when did Cayley collect the clothes in a bundle? Again, the only answer was, before Robert's arrival. So another X was wanted, to fit those three conditions. And the answer was that a murder was intended, even before Robert arrived? Yes. Well, now, it couldn't be intended on the strength of that letter, unless there was very much more behind the letter than we know. Nor was it possible a murder could be intended without any more preparation than the changing into a different suit in which to escape. The thing was too childish. Also, if Robert was to be murdered, why go out of the way to announce his existence to you all, even at the cost of some trouble, to Mrs. Norbury? What did it all mean? I didn't know. But I began to feel now that Robert was an incident only, that the plot was a plot of Cayley's against Mark, either to get him to kill his brother, or to get his brother to kill him, and that for some inexplicable reason Mark seemed to be lending himself to the plot. He was silent for a little, and then said, almost to himself, I had seen the empty brandy bottles in that cupboard. You never said anything about them, complained Bill. I only saw them afterwards. I was looking for the collar, you remember. They came back to me afterwards. I knew how Cayley would feel it. Poor devil. Go on, said Bill. Well, then, we had the inquest, and of course I noticed, and I suppose you did too, the curious fact that Robert had asked his way at the second lodge and not at the first. So I talked to Amos and Parsons. That made it more curious. Amos told me that Robert had gone out of his way to speak to him, had called to him, in fact. Parsons told me that his wife was out in their little garden at the first lodge all afternoon and was certain that Robert had never come past it. He also told me that Cayley had put him on to a job on the front lawn that afternoon. So I had another guess. Robert had used the secret passage, the passage which comes out into the park between the first and second lodges. Robert, then, had been in the house. It was a put-up job between Robert and Cayley. But how could Robert be there without Mark knowing? Obviously Mark knew, too. What did it all mean? When was this? interrupted Bill. Just after the inquest? After you'd seen Amos and Parsons, of course? Yes, I got up and left them, and I came to look for you. I got back to the clothes then. Why did Mark change his clothes so secretly? Disguise? But then what about his face? That was much more important than clothes. His face, his beard, he'd have to shave off his beard, 
and then oh idiot i saw you looking at that poster mark acting mark made up mark disguised oh priceless idiot mark was robert matches please bill passed over the matches again waited till antony had relit his pipe and then held out his hand for them just as they were going into the other's pocket yes said bill thoughtfully yes but wait a moment what about the plough and horses antony looked at him comically you'll never forgive me bill he said you'll never come clue hunting with me again what do you mean antony sighed it was a fake watson i wanted you out of the way i wanted to be alone i'd guessed at my ex and i wanted to test it to test it every way by everything we discovered i simply had to be alone just then so he smiled and added well i knew you wanted a drink you are a devil said bill staring at him and your interest when i told you that a woman had been staying there well it was only polite to be interested when you'd taken so much trouble you brute you you sherlock and then you keep trying to steal my matches well go on that's all my ex fitted did you guess miss norris and all that well not quite i didn't realize that cayley had worked for it from the beginning had put miss norris up to frightening mark i thought he'd just seized the opportunity bill was silent for a long time then puffing at his pipe he said slowly has cayley shot himself antony shrugged his shoulders poor devil said bill it was decent of you to give him a chance i'm glad you did i couldn't help liking cayley in a kind of way you know he's a clever devil if you hadn't turned up just when you did he would never have been found out i wonder it was ingenious but it's often the ingenious thing which gets found out the awkward thing from cayley's point of view was that though mark was missing neither he nor his body could ever be found well that doesn't often happen with a missing man he generally gets discovered in the end a professional criminal perhaps not but an amateur like mark he might have kept the secret of how he killed mark but i think it would have been obvious sooner or later that he had killed him yes there's something in that oh just tell me one thing why did mark tell miss norbury about his imaginary brother that's puzzled me rather too bill it may be that he was just doing the othello business painting himself black all over i mean he may have been so full of his appearance as robert that he had almost got to believe in robert and had to tell everybody more likely though he felt that having told all of you at the house he had better tell miss norbury in case she met one of you in which case if you mentioned the approaching arrival of robert she might say oh i'm certain he has no brother he would have told me if he had and so spoil his joke possibly too cayley put him on to it cayley obviously wanted as many people as possible to know about robert are you going to tell the police yes i suppose they'll have to know cayley may have left another confession i hope he won't give me away you see i've been a sort of accessory since yesterday evening and i must go and see miss norbury i asked explained bill because i was wondering what i should say to to betty miss calladine you see she's bound to ask perhaps you won't see her again for a long long time said antony sadly as a matter of fact i happen to know that she will be at the barringtons and i go up there to-morrow well you'd better tell her you're obviously longing to only don't let her say anything for a day or two i'll write to you right ho 
Antony knocked the ashes out of his pipe and got up. The Barringtons, he said. Large party? Fairly, I think. Antony smiled at his friend. Yes. Well, if any of them should happen to be murdered, you might send for me. I'm just getting into the swing of it. End of chapter 22 Recording by Kirsten Weber End of The Red House Mystery by A. A. Milne